This is week number seven, as we're talking about the last days. Today, we're finally going to move into the tribulation. We've been kind of hovering around that day, but we haven't moved into it yet. Now, uh, we've looked at the rapture. We've looked at the end times. We've looked at the worldview uh, in the end times, how the world is going to be reacting, and, and the apostasy of the church. And in order for Jesus to come on the clouds, one of the things that must happen is the church must apostatize from the biblical viewpoint of Jesus and of God and of heaven in the future. And we're seeing a, an extraordinary apostasy going on right now. If you haven't noticed it, it's because it's been slow, it's been gradual, and yet now people don't honor God in the sanctuary. People don't honor God in the pulpits. That's why so many preachers wear jeans, and it's not a popular thing for me to say this, but I'm not a popular preacher. I am telling people right now that if you see a preacher wearing jeans on a Sunday morning, he's not acting like the high priest did when he came before the God of heaven and earth to honor him. And preachers, so many now want to, want to blend in with the sheep rather than being a leader and a shepherd to the sheep. And that's part of the apostasy. One of the easiest things to spot, but then we can go into doctrine, we can go in what's talked about, we can go in all the homosexuals that are in the pulpit. People that are setting up churches based on their two pastors being homosexuals and having 20,000 people in that church at the end of the year, that's apostasy. People don't realize that. That's just not a little side thinking. It's all over the country. It's in every state. It's in almost every major city. And so we're going to be looking at the tribulation events today, and we're going to be looking at how our glorified bodies are taking us into that. But now we're going to talk first about prophetically how God's timetable operates. So we're going to go over to Hosea, Hosea chapter 6. And I'm going to open up in prayer. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name right now over your people here today, over this message. Over all those that are watching here, watching live, and we'll see any part of this even briefly, even momentarily into the future. Father God, that you give me the words to say to them, that I'd open up their minds to the scriptures that you have given all of us. And Father God, I thank you for that now in Jesus' name. And that you open up our mind and the windows of our understanding. And that one word, not one prophecy is robbed, even from those peering in momentarily, peering into television, peering in live or later on. And Father God, that I deliver this as a delightful prophetic meal to your people in Jesus name and all God's people said. Amen. amen and amen. Now, in Hosea chapter six, it says, come, let us return to Yahweh, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. Now, we know that that's talking about Israel, but it's also talking about the Gentile nations as well. Because the Gentile nations have needed healing, and Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. Even though he went to the Jews, God spoke to him and said, I want you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That's us. Verse 2, he will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So let us know, let us press on to know Yahweh. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Now let's analyze every verse here. And then we're going to look at our timetable and see what's happening. Uh, first of all, as we look at this, recognize that what we've determined so far in this series, that death is not the end of our life. Our conception was the beginning of our life, but our death in this age is not the end of our life. And we're either going to die to glory or we're going to die to corruption. We're going to die to shame. And so we're, some of us are going to see everlasting life and some of us are going to be held in contempt and be thrown into, uh, into hell for eternity. So what is God's timeline? Does God have a timeline? Is it exacting? And is it something that we can depend on? So what we're looking at here, it says he will revive us after two days. 
So the two days is the day, uh, the two days of the church. It is the two days of grace. The two days of grace, that is a reviving. For 4,000 years, man had no sacrifice for sin. And the only ones that even had a close sacrifice for sin were the Jews, but their sacrifice was temporary. The best it could do is last one year. But then they had to go back and make another sacrifice. But Jesus, being the perfect sacrifice, once and for all, for all mankind, died for our sins. He is the perfect sacrifice. And so we know that he will revive us after two days. So that two day period of time, we are in a type of revival, you could say. But two days is a very specific time frame. We know that prophetically speaking, one day, two days, six days, seven days is used regularly in the Old Testament and now in the New Testament to determine the age of mankind, the next coming events, the next prophetic events that are supposed to occur. All right, so we know that the day of man is six days, then the day of the millennium is the seventh day, a total of 7,000 years, each day representing 1,000 years. When Adam was told by God, because you have sinned, uh, or was warned uh, by God, if you eat of the fruit of the of the tree of the garden, uh, in that day you shall die. And the question comes up in people's mind is, well, Adam didn't die on that day, therefore the Bible was lying. But God wasn't speaking of a 24-hour period of time. He was speaking prophetically of a thousand-year reign. Amen. And Adam died at 930 years, short of 1,000 years. In that day you will die. But we were supposed to live forever in this mortal coil, in this mortal body. And so all these things, you have to be careful how you use it. You can't say that, you know, well, God is, you know, going to wait 10,000 years or 100,000 years. We have to be careful how we use this. And every prophecy is determined by groups of prophets, not by one singular prophet of how to interpret prophecy. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day. So now there's shadows and types. And now as we look at this, we can say that he will revive us. All the dead for the last 2,000 years that died in Christ, they are in the ground. We know that they shall be raised. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who remain and are alive shall be caught up with him in the clouds, so we shall ever be with him. So the dead in Christ, the righteous dead, shall be raised up. All those that died prior to Jesus going to the cross, that died righteous, that had the gospel preached to them, when they were in Sheol, in Hades, they shall be lifted up. They shall be given a glorified body. And now the, those that are alive and remain, when we see all this happening, we shall be caught up with him in the clouds and we shall ever be with the Lord. There will be no coming back as, as a human being in the state that we are in. We will be called human beings, but we will not be in this state, in this mortal coil, in this body, this earth suit. All right. So that's what we found out so far. Now, whenever we look at any numbers in scripture, our God is in three parts. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are made up in three parts because God said, I'm going to make you up to look like us. Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. And we know that we're spirit, soul, and body. When we don't have a body, we're not a complete human being. That's why those that are dead in Christ without a body are going to be raised up and given a body at the time of the rapture, at the time of the re revealing of the saints, of the revealing of Jesus on the clouds. Okay, so that's what's going on there. But there's three is a number that's used a lot. And now we see three being used again. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So we are going to live close beside him, before him, in our resurrected bodies, in our glorified bodies. That's what this means. So this prophetic statement was made roughly about 650 years, 700 years B.C. before Christ when this was made. So prophecy has been telling us that there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous for a very, very long time, 2,500 years at least in this, and more so in other scriptures. So let us know, let us press on to know Yahweh, 
His going forth is as certain. How certain is the 2,000 years? It's certain. We're coming to the end of the 2,000 years. How certain is the, the, the third day? We know that that is certain too, and that is coming. Now, when we get our glorified bodies, then we're going to come back to the earth, and we're going to be ruling and reigning in the earth for 1,000 years as kings and priests. All right. Now, let's look at our timetable. Parim is right at the very beginning, and it means to crush and uh, break entirely. Now, Parim was, was a, a non-Mosaic festival added because of Esther and what, uh, and what uh, was attempted to be done to the Jews. Esther delivered the Jews and from uh, the, evil, uh, the evil men that were uh, living in that day. And so that festival is shared today, but it's not a festival called a Mosaic festival, but it's very important. All right. And then we have Passover. If you look over to the significance on this chart, you'll see that in Passover, under significance, it says fulfilled. That's the Last Supper communion instituted in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so Jesus has the, uh, what we call the Last Supper, known as Passover. When we celebrate communion today, we are simply celebrating a miniaturized or shortened version of Passover. We do that every, every time we have communion here. Everyone who has communion at any time. All right, then we have unleavened bread. Jesus' body was unleavened in the grave. It never rotted and never bloated in the grave. There are seven festival days. In fact, I'll go down through them really quickly. We have Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, weeks, trumpets, day of atonement, booths or tabernacles, and then Hanukkah. But the seven, the dark black ones on this chart, are the ones that came from Moses. And this is a biblical prophetic timetable. All right, we're, we're going to see very quickly, if you look at significance in the center, we're going to see that Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits and weeks, it says fulfilled, 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 and fulfilled. Now, this is a chart that I put together. All right, so Passover has already been fulfilled as a prophetic event. Unleavened bread, Jesus' body did not corrupt in the grave. That is a prophetic event that was fulfilled with his dying at the cross. And Moses gave us this prophetic event when he told us that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to ha have unleavened bread. Why? It was the bread of haste. The leaven did not get to have the bread rise. And so the, the Jews left Egypt in haste. And that was the significance of that. Or one of the significance. Then we find out that we were supposed to share first fruits. Jesus was the first fruits from the dead. He was the first resurrected from the dead. He's called the first fruits in the New Testament all the time. All right. So was first fruits fulfilled prophetically? Yes, it was. When Jesus came out of the grave as the first fruits from the dead. And then we have weeks. We call that in Christianity today, uh, Pentecost weeks is seven weeks times seven added plus one day, totaling 50 days in weeks or Shavuot, it, Pentecost in Greek, meaning 50 days from Passover, that was fulfilled when the Holy Spirit came on the upper room and we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not once, but for anyone who wants to receive it even today. The baptism of the Holy Spirit wasn't just a great story for us to read it in the book of Acts and then forget about it and say, well, God doesn't do that anymore. Whoever says that, that's an apostasy of the church that it's only occurred in the church in recent years. When I say recent years, over the last couple centuries. All right, so uh, the, the, the out of the seven, Feast of the Jews, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and weeks have already been prophetically fulfilled. And these are all spring feasts. When do we celebrate Easter? In the spring. And when do we celebrate Pentecost? If you follow church doctrine, Pentecost is celebrated in the spring. And I've given the dates when these are going to be celebrated by the Jews in 2022. And you can see those dates there. All right, so you know when they're coming. Now, the dates that have not been prophetically fulfilled yet are the timetable that we're waiting to see happen to the church and to the world. So the next one that we see here on my chart is trumpets or New Year's. It's trumpets or New Year's is called Rosh Hashanah. 
And that means the, the head of the year, Rosh means head or first or front. So Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year or the first of the year or the beginning of the year. It's known as the new year, the new civil year of the Jews. But it's also called trumpets. And we know that it's called trumpets because Moses called the trumpets that you are to sound the trumpets. And it was known as the last trumpet. Now, without confusing everyone here, I don't want to confuse anyone because I haven't taken a lot of time yet to get into this. But there is the first trump, the last trump, and the great trump. Plus, there's a couple other trumpets in the book of Revelation, like the seventh trumpet. But here, this is known as the last trumpet. And when this trumpet sounds, Jesus returns on the clouds. We know that Jesus is going to return with the shout of the archangel and with the, the sound of trumpets or the sound of a trumpet. And that's what that means. That's the last trumpet. Jesus is returning. Not the great trumpet, but that's known as the last trumpet. This time period is also known to the Jews today, all over the world, rabbis all over the world know that th when this celebration comes, which just occurred for the Jews just last month, when this comes, we know that the Jews call it Rosh Malek, or it is the first king or the coronation of the king. And so Rosh Hashanah, trumpets, uh, the Jewish New Year has a bunch of different names, and it begins something that's known as the Ten Days of Awe. And the Ten Days of Awe, celebrated by, by religious Jews every year, begins with the trumpets or the New Year, and then they have ten days of mourning, ten days of Fasting, maybe not straight fasting, but 10 days of introspection to see if they are worthy of God. At the beginning, at trumpets, recognize we know prophetically that the church is caught up and the righteous dead are caught up to be with Jesus in the clouds. What is going to happen on that day? I want you to think about this. When you have potentially 10% 20% of humanity disappearing in one event that you saw. If you were in a coma, you'd wake up to see it. If you were asleep, you'd be wake, woken up to see it. The shout of the archangel, the trumpet blast would wake you up. And there'd be other things to make sure that you got woken up. Whether you were going up or not, you would see these events. So there'd be no denying that the events occurred. What you would have to have after that event occurred, if you were left behind, is you'd have to have a series of people talking you out of what you just saw. You would have to have talking heads paint a picture and tell you that what you saw you didn't see. It was an apparition, it was a spaceship, it was a meteor that had some secret ingredients in it that just simply absorbed those that couldn't go into the rest of the new age with the rest of us. It would have been something, it'll come up really cleverly put together, but it won't be God. And this 10 days of awe, I believe will be something that will be happening right on the first moment of the rapture of the church. If you're laying in bed with your wife and she's saved and you're not, for those that are old enough to remember Archie Bunker and Edith, you know that, you know, he just said, Edith, you go, you go to talk to the big man for me at church. And he would never go. Not that I can recall. And so many people are like that today. The marriage is intact, they have a good marriage, but one is saved, one is not saved. We have children that are saved, parents not saved. We have parents that are saved, children not saved. And so when all these people disappear, there's gonna be a vacuum that's gonna be created just, geo just technically. You're gonna have people that are raptured out of airplanes that are flying. You're gonna have people that are raptured in nuclear power plants. You're going to have people raptured that their car, they were driving down the street and they got raptured right then and there. And their cars maybe wandered to a, you know, a curb somewhere. You're going to have all kinds of chaos going on. And immediately what it's going to cause people to do, I believe, 
because I believe that this timetable not only is prophetic, but it's prophetic showing us how people are going to think right after this day on the day of the rapture. And a lot of people are going to be very, very quiet for a period of time. Now, and the Jewish, when the Jews do every single year, when they come up to Rosh Hashanah, trumpets, New Year, what they do is they spend 10 days in introspection, examining themselves, and it's understood that on the first day, their names, next in the book of life, their names are written in the book of life, but then there are notes put next to their name. Whether they, the next 12 months or the next year will be a positive year based on the previous year, or be a negative year for them based on the previous year. It's not karma, but what's happening is, is that now they have an opportunity to look back over the past 12 months. So the Jews, religious Jews today are practicing this. They look back for that 10 day period of time, fasting at times, and they look back and they say, how did I behave this past year? And they look at their behavior and they look at their actions, and they look at their words, and they look at their thoughts, and in that 10-day period of time, God is watching their repentance. And if they don't repent significantly or appropriately, or if they're arrogant towards God, then on the 10th day, their name and whatever was initially written at the beginning of the 10 days was sealed. And what that means is it's sealed until the following year and it's sealed as your fate has been determined for the next 12 months about how it's going to go for you. It's either going to go well or it's not going to go well. Again, this is not karma. This is God. And this is something that Moses prescribed by the voice of God and the hand of God. So now imagining what's happening. We're entering the seven year tribulation. The first three and a half years are known as the small tribulation or the little tribulation. The second three and a half years are known as the great tribulation. So notice that when something starts out, it starts out slow if it's bad and it keeps spiraling out of control, snowballing in effect. And so what's gonna happen immediately in those 10 days is you're gonna have people, Jews and non-Jews alike, examining themselves, looking at themselves, wondering what's going on. And I believe by the spirit of the Lord that there is going to be a revival, a private revival that's going to break out for that 10 days. At the end of that 10 days, and I believe, and I can point to it, and I'll try to point to it a little later, we know that there's going to be 144,000 male Jews. They're going to be preachers of the gospel during this first three and a half year time frame. Those male Jews that have never been married, they're virgins. According to the word of God, never known a woman, nor are they married. They have all the time in the world to preach. I believe that the majority of them, if not all of them, will get saved because they're going to see Messiah on the clouds and they're going to mourn and weep over him whom they've crucified. Amen. They didn't crucify him physically back 2,000 years ago, but they've been crucifying him either by ignoring him or saying that Jesus was not the Messiah. And they're going to recognize him for who he is. And with pure hearts, there's going to be a revival that's going to break out. And revival after revival is going to break out. But there's going to be other things that are going to be happening. Those other things that are going to be happening is, first of all, after a couple days... Let me back up. When Desert Storm happened in 1991, people showed up in church for about two weeks. I was, I was a pastor at that time, I happened to know, but I wasn't pastoring this church. I was a temporary pastor of another church in the area. And uh, people showed up, but then they disappeared. Then in... Uh, 9-11, 2001, this church was here. We were over at where Famous Dave's is now in our own building. And the church filled up fully the first week. And 
The second week was about half the population. The first week, we must have had 140 people crowded in that little building. Then we were down to about 90, then we're down probably to 70, and then on week four, we were nearly back to where we were prior to 9-11. What happens to human beings, what happens to Christians, is when we see a great tragedy come upon the earth, we immediately want to seek God for answers. There are no atheists in foxholes. You ever hear of that? But how many people went into a foxhole and all of a sudden got Jesus, got revival, got delivered, made all kinds of promises to God. God, will you get me out of here? I'll, you can make me a priest. God, if you get me out of here, I'll marry my girlfriend. God, if you get me out of here, you know, just come up with whatever a man might be thinking in a foxhole. Keep me alive. Of course, when they get out, they go to their local priest back home and say, God, I made some promises to God. I made some promises to God. Uh, and do you think God really wants me to become a priest? Stuff like that. And they said, nah, you know, if you want to get out of that, get out of it. What ends up happening is when the pressure is off, people go back to their former lifestyle. I know that going to jails, I went to jails for almost 20 years. I preached in the jails three times a week. I went to the prisons about once a month in the area. And I can tell you all the people in the prisons that were going to get released, and particularly all the people in the jails. Oh, pastor, when I get out of here, you are going to be the first person I stop to see and come to your church. I, in one year period of time, led 186 men and women to the Lord just in one jail over here in Baraboo, in one year. And I had spreadsheets, and I calculated, and I looked at everything, and I looked at how successful that ministry was becoming. And yet, not one person, when they got out, when the pressure was off, wanted to be here. Because the pressure was off. And so is it like people today. But what's going to be happening during the tribulation is the pressure won't let off. And the pressure is going to be building and building and building, and it's going to be a snowball of negative effects. So what's going to be happening a couple days after the rapture of the church? A couple days after the rapture of the church, uh, you're going to have some neighbors breaking into your house just to see what they can steal before someone else steals it. And if you've left any, any, any buddy behind, uh, neighbors aren't going to be acting neighborly any longer. What do we know about the arrival of the Antichrist? We know that what restrains him now, he will not appear because what restrains him now is the praying church. Amen. And when I say church, I mean individuals. I don't mean, a, uh, I don't mean a church building. I don't mean pews and chairs. I don't even mean a body necessarily, but I mean individuals praying. When the individuals that are praying, even a little bit, leave, demons are going to be released in people and your neighbors are going to turn into, um, they're just going to be turned into awful, awful people. Amen. And they are going to be barbarians. Uh, look at what happened uh, to those that were in Germany. They acted like barbarians to their neighbors. They acted like barbarians to uh, the, uh, the infirm towards Catholics. E even though the majority of them were already Catholic, they acted like barbarians, to, of course, to the Jews. Seven million Jews, another seven million other people that were massacred by them. They acted like barbarians to the Polish soldiers and the Poles. And when they were fo faced with it, when they, many, some of them were in prison camps, were faced with, the, with videos, with films of what they were doing, some of them were seen crying. They turned into barbarians. Well, the opening days of the tribulation are somewhat going to be a little bit like that, where there's not going to be no restraint. There's not going to be any neighborly restraint. There's not going to be anyone practicing Christianity because all those practic practicing Christianity just left. And so all the restraints that were on mankind are now going to be lifted and man are, is going to be barbarous to one another at low levels, neighborhood to neighborhood. What do you think is going to be happening in politics? Barbarous. What do you going to be think is going to be happening in the military? Barbarous. What do you think is going to be happening from nation to nation that is barbarous? Within a short, short period of time, what will more likely happen is there'll be a, well, I don't want to call it a nuclear war. It won't be a war. There'll be nuclear arms, I believe, that will be released upon one nation or another nation. And it'll be, it'll be the beginning of the birth pangs. It'll be getting worse and worse and worse. So by the time we get up to the three and a half years, the mid-tribulation, 
Jesus, the Apostle Paul, the prophets all said birth pangs. If you've had a child, ladies, if men, if you're married and you have been with your wife when she's going through labor pains, it builds, it builds, it builds, it builds, and there's no stopping it. You know you can't stop it. You can ask for a little medication, but you can't stop what's coming. And it builds and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And the birth pangs of the tribulation increase and increase and increase. So, uh, so we have this time, this uh, 10 days of awe, where we atone for personal sins, and the whole earth is going to be filled with perplexity about what happened at the rapture. And I believe that there's going to be a great revival, although short-lived at that time. It'll be personal. How many people are living with people right now? How many boyfriends are out there right now? Won't get married to you, ladies, because he's unsaved. Right? How many children are living with their girlfriends and boyfriends? They don't want to get saved, but they saw mom and dad praying every morning. They know where their seven Bibles are at in their home. They know what they used to say. They know the church they used to go to. And they know how to say the Our Father, though they haven't said it in two decades. Guess what's going to happen with those people? Instant salvation. Amen. They're going to go, oh, no, I heard about this. I didn't actually think it was going to happen in my lifetime. Oh, no. And they're going to be the first group, the easy group. They're going to be the low hanging fruit to get saved right away. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Come on. Now. So all this begins what's what's known as the apocalypse. Well, the apocalypse is a Latin word. It means to uncover. It means to disclose, to, to reveal. Ever, any, ever hear anyone say that the book of Revelation is too hard to read? Well, the word revelation means to reveal, not to hide. So we got to stop thinking like a bunch of drone Christians following after other drone Christians that say it's too hard to understand. My plumbing's pretty hard to understand, but if I stare at it long enough, I'll figure something out. Amen. Amen. And if we stare at the book of Revelation long enough, we'll figure it out. Now, let's go over to the book of Revelation. All right. So the next coming event, I just want to clarify, will be trumpets. It won't be the Day of Atonement. It won't be booths or tabernacles. It'll just be trumpets. For right now, I just want to deal with that. All right. So let's go over to Revelation chapter six and let's find out what's happening. Revelation chapter six, verse one. Then I saw... When the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. All right, so we see several times in the book of Revelation, my father in the faith, the man who ordained me, Dr. Hilton Sutton, he would say, come up here. And he would just do it just like that. So I've tried to imitate him from time to time. So here's one of the times where we see come, which is really a coming up to see something. In verse 2, I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, one of the titles of Rosh Hashanah, the civil new year, the next prophetic event to occur, the next prophetic event on our prophetic timetable. Remember, four of them have already been done. We can't go back. They're not ever going to be redone. But trumpets has not yet been done. So Jesus comes on the cloud, on the clouds, with a shout of an archangel, with a trumpet blast, and the dead in Christ rise first, and those who are alive and remain are caught up to be with him, and we, so we shall ever be with him. And here we see the very first event I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, most commentators that I've read said that this is the Antichrist because Jesus doesn't need a crown, but this is happening right in the first opening time frame of the seven year tribulation. And Jews, historically, for 3,000 years, rabbis for 3,000 years have been saying it is Yom Malek, or it is the day of the king, the coronation day. 
So as I have studied this out, and I could be wrong, and I don't want to be dogmatic about this, it doesn't matter. What we're seeing here is someone's being released. Whether it's the Antichrist or Jesus on a white horse, it really doesn't matter. In the end, we're not going to be here. We'll be viewing these events from heaven. But someone is given a crown, and I can't see the Antichrist or Satan being given a crown. And people will ask the question, why would Jesus go out there conquering and to conquer? Why would he go out with a bow to conquer? I want to turn you over. Hold your place there because we're coming right back to it. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... The other character that we saw in chapter 6 is on a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. So Jesus is on a white horse. What did he ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? Right? A white colt. Right? And in righteousness he judges and wages war. So Jesus is waging war. Now, you know, we talked about this, how angels could go out and kill 185 Assyrians in one night and not bat an eye, not shed one tear. Because from a spiritual standpoint, when you and I look back at the earth in our glorified bodies, we're going to have a different perspective of human life completely. The angels do and Jesus does. And that perspective we cannot look at from a liberal, queasy Oh, I'm so afraid that, you know, God's going to judge because God doesn't judge anyone. Yes, he does. Amen. Verse 12, and his eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except for himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, not his blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So we know that Jesus is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And right, and he came and, and dwelt amongst men. John chapter 1, right? So we know that. So we know that Jesus was called the Word of God, right? He's always been called the Word of God. Verse 14, and the armies which are in heaven. Where are they at? In heaven. Not in hell. They're not in Sheol. They're in heaven. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So what we see here is a picture of white horses, Jesus leading an army of other angelic hosts, following him on white horses. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. What is the wine press? You know what a wine press is? For those of you that are uninitiated to the making of wine, I've never done this. I've seen it on television, but you put wines in there. Now, you know, it's really cute that they have women get in there and stomping out the wine. But, you know, even 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day, not much of that was really, really done. What they did is they would put something over the top and they would just tighten it down and they would press out the grapes. They would just press them out. And it would, it would, it would be all stone and there'd be a stone funnel and it'd be running down into a stone square canister in Israel and other places around the Middle East. And all that juice would be falling out, and then it, that would be gathered and put into wineskins to ferment, to turn into fermented wine. Great wine press of God's wrath is the pressing of humans, unrighteous, wicked human, human life on earth, and their blood is being squished in the great wine press of God. And I've talked about that wine press at length back a couple years ago for several Sundays on how powerful that is and how destructive that is. And Jesus, it says in chapter 19, is heading up the pressing out of the wine press Amen. where the blood is going to flow. And you're not going to be there, but you're going to be watching it from heaven. Amen. OK, so let's go back to Revelation chapter six. Let's continue to see what's happening. OK. In Revelation chapter 6, all right, so whether it's Jesus 
in verses 1 and 2, or it's an angel of heaven in 1 and 2, I do not believe that God will give a crown to anyone that's not righteous, including the Antichrist or Satan or anybody else. Verse 3, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, and another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to him to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. So if you take peace from the earth, what do you got? You got chaos, you got war. You, got not, you not only have factions, you got roving bands of hoodlums, Roving from town to town, slaughtering. And by the way, this goes on in Africa even now. I've had contact even from uh, some countries uh, around Kenya, not in Kenya, but around Kenya that we support, saying there was a band, a group of religious fanatics that were roving from town to town. And what did they do? They raped the women, then killed them. They killed the boys and the girls, or took the boys and the girls as booty, as prisoner. They, what they couldn't carry, they burned to the ground. They burned down all the crops. They killed all the animals. It's called a scorched earth. When you have a scorched earth, what do you have right after scorched earth? You have famine, you have disease, you have sickness, and you have pestilence. All that's going to be going on in the first couple weeks, the first couple months, certainly the first year which is going to move very quickly. There's not going to be any rest from this. When, when people take a breath and go, oh, oh, glad that's over, then the next day or the next hour, there's going to be another pestilence, another attack. Then you're going to have nation rising up against nation, against nation. Jesus talked about that. When you see nation rising up against nation, do not fear. See, these things are being said for our benefit so we can know what's going to happen in the future, but not so that we can have fear about it. That's in part. The second part is that the Jews that are left behind, the Gentiles that are left behind, when they see these things happening on the earth, that know that that prophetic timetable is, in fact, moving along. The clock is ticking and it's, the timetable is moving ahead. Let's keep reading. All right. So a great sword, a great sword, I believe, would be nuclear holocaust of some kind. The atom bomb was dropped on two cities in Japan. And what happened? I think it was about a quarter of a million dead immediately in each city. About another 800,000 died later on. Whatever the numbers are, it was dramatic. And you know what it did? It broke the back of that country. They said, uncle, and they, they, they signed for peace. Amen. All right, what's going to be happening? People are going to be brutal one another, and it's going to create in some areas famines, as we're going to see here in a moment. All right, so this great sword cannot be just a tank, cannot be just a regular bomb or a dynamite, but a great sword has got to be a modern nuclear weapon that's used in various places. What else do you have with nuclear weapons? You have nuclear fallout, right? You have radiation that's now moving in a cloud. What happened when all that nuclear radiation in Japan came out of that nuclear plant when it was overrun, what was it, eight, ten years ago with a giant tsunami wave? That radiation actually hit Alaska and California. What do we know about the fires out west from last summer again? As is this almost every summer. We were looking at a red sky in the morning, not from red sky, but from the haze in the atmosphere. We know that the majority of pollution doesn't come from cars. The majority of the, the, the air pollution that we have today comes from volcanoes and forest fires. A thousand times more than any, new, any human debris that we put into our atmosphere. Just so that you know. That's a fact. So, what do we have? This great sword is being given and countries are at war. There's wars within the countries. There's war amongst the leaders of each country. Verse 5, then he broke the third seal and I heard the third living creature saying, come. And I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. Well, a denarius back in Jesus' day was one day's wage. 
So if you, got, you work for eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, and you get paid a denarius, all you can buy with it is a quart of wheat, which will maybe make you a couple loaves of bread. What this is, is not starvation, but it's rationing, and you can eat and not be satisfied. And I'm going to show you something so powerful, it's going to shock you. All right, then, so now, but the, the, the oil and the wine, that's not depreciated. But other foods, there'll be limitations, maybe not over the entire earth, but there'll be famines and limited resources to eat from during the early days of the tribulation. Why is that? Scorched earth. Look at any, uh, look at any country that recently went socialist. I don't want to be political here, but there are bread lines. If there is gasoline, there are gasoline lines. It's not for a lack of bread or lack of gasoline. These are man-made shortages, either from war, politics, or simply just communism. Communism, socialism does not work. And it's not biblical. All right, and then verse 7 when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. I looked and behold an ashen horse and he who sat on it had the name death and Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and with wild beast of the earth. Now, the word death and the word Hades are extremely important. The word death is a character. Now, that certainly could be the Antichrist. It certainly could be Satan. But rather than trying to figure out who it is, look that it says Hades. Well, Hades is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Sheol. Sheol is the holding place now for all unrighteous that die. All unrighteous dead are in Sheol right now. So when they do this, whatever group this is, and whatever groups they are, they are mass amounts of unrighteous, unsaved human beings dying at the hands of all kinds of wars, pestilences, famines, diseases. They will be, although worldwide, we're seeing here, look at this, to kill with the sword and the famine and pestilence by wild beasts of the earth and a fourth of the earth. Now, that's not taking the earth and drawing out a quarter of it and saying, okay, that's only going to happen in Australia and New Zealand. A fourth of the earth means that your neighbors are going to get hit. One out of four people in your neighborhood are going to hit, get hit with it. One out of four people in your county. One out of four people in your state. One out of four people in your country are going to be affected by this death and Hades. Death and Sheol. So it's going to be widespread, although it's only going to affect one out of every four people living. Interesting. Okay, now, so there's going to be great confusion. People are going to be looking for a leader. And what's the first thing people look for in leadership in times of catastrophe like this? Believe it or not, it's not spiritual. It's military. And they're going to be looking for military leaders. And this is at the time the Antichrist is going to, who's not going to be revealed at this moment in time. But some people will know who he is. He might even know who he is. But he will begin now to, to increase himself very, very quickly. He will be promoted very qu quickly as a political leader and as a military leader. Because why? There's no church around to depend on God. And here's one of the problems that the church has today. We don't depend on God enough. We depend on our vote to count rather than our prayer to count. I believe we ought to be doing both, but we shouldn't be doing one without the prayer. Amen. I want to take you over to Jeremiah chapter 15, Jeremiah 15. And I'm going to start reading in verse two. And it shall be that when they say to you, uh, where should you go? Then you are to tell them, thus says Yahweh, those destined for death to death, those destined for the sword to the sword, those destined for famine to famine, those destined for captivity to captivity, I will point over them four kinds of doom. When I 
saw this and I've known this in my head. I have known it in my spirit when, when God this week began to show me that this three or four or five different kinds of doom coming on mankind. The first time it happens is not in the tribulation. Whenever judgment comes, look at back in verse one. Then Yahweh said to me, even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not be with this people. Send them away from my presence and let them go. And then we go uh, destined for death, death, sword, sword, famine, famine, captivity, captivity. I will appoint over them four kinds of doom, declares Yahweh, the sword to slay, the dogs to drag off, and the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. What's happening in the United States right now? If anyone about beast, does anyone know? I'll tell you. Kathy and I, we got married in 1977 and our anniversary trip, not our anniversary trip, our, our honeymoon trip, we packed up our, our little puppy, our, our tent, put him in my Firebird, and we drove up into the mountains of Colorado all the way from uh, Omaha at the time, and we found a back road uh, and went, we, we went out of uh, Colorado Springs and found a back road, drove on that, you know, shouldn't be driving it in a Firebird, drove off the road, backed up to a tree, and we camped. Then later on, as part of that, we went to Yellowstone. And when we were in Yellowstone on our first anniversary, we were, we were the only two of six people that we saw for five days on trails. We went into the back country and there were bears back there and there were coyotes back there and, and there weren't any wolves at that time. And then later on, when we started renting RVs, we went to Yellowstone and our children were all small. I remember one in particular, David was having his birthday in our RV in, in August and we're there and we're in a parking lot in the canyon parking lot, if you've ever been to Yellowstone, right? And where all the shops are. And we couldn't get out of our RV because the buffalo were so thick that you could have been killed by the buffalo, which are the biggest reason for death, human death in Yellowstone. But then they introduced wolves in 1994 and introduced another 35 in 1995. Now there's almost 10,000 wolves. There used to be uh, 30,000 elk, now they're down to three or 4,000 elk. There used to be uh, marmots and black-tailed deer and bunny rabbits and, and all kinds of cool little animals you can see everywhere. They're all gone. Bears and packs of wolves go and they're killing off the rest of the bison and the rest of, and, and, and the, the so-called, the naturalists, they were saying, well, just, it'll take some years for the elk and the uh, other animals to get used to having predators around. No, it won't. Too many predators kills off at it, everything. And we've seen bear, black bear on our property. We had a black bear at this church just, what, five months ago? We got it on film. There are wolves. We've seen wolves. Wolf, there was wolf hunt on my property this January, and someone got a, uh, pushed a wolf either off our property or through someone else's property onto our property and killed it. Big wolf hunts. What do wolves do? They are predatory animals that are dangerous even to human beings. I used to be a tree hugger. I still like to hug trees, but I don't like to hug wolves. I love the, I love the outdoors. But all this, all these predatory animals are taking away everything to eat and what's left and what will be left. What was what, one of the things that was happening even in Israel is that there are in archaeological finds, there are fossils of lions living in Israel. And so when in Proverbs, the, uh, it was said in Proverbs, the sluggard says in his bed, uh, I can't go outside. There's a lion in the streets. He's actually being truthful that there's lions out there, but he's using it as an excuse not to go to work. And so what's going to be happening, one of the four things that's going to be happening during the tribulation period, one of the things happening will be attacks by wild animals. You think all the tree huggers are unified now? Wait until the non-tree huggers are taken out of the way. Oh, yeah. 
The spotted owl, because of the spotted owl, uh, entire forests were being forced not to be lumbered out and then replanted later on. Just over a spotted owl, and that was owl, that was 35 years ago. Now we've got the kangaroo rat and all kinds of other things where we're saving the forest for the kangaroo rat, like the kangaroo rat really understands. I'm not being political. I'm just giving you facts of life. That's the way it is right now. It's never been that way. When you went out west in the 1800s and the 1700s, if you saw a wolf, you killed it. And that government put a bounty on wolves because they killed cattle and they killed the human beings. And the same thing with mountain lions. Read the news. Children die to mountain lions in the United States every year. They're dragged off, never seen again. It happens. Okay, now... Let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 7. Then afterwards declares Yahweh, I will give over to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, even those who survive in the city, from the pestilence, the sword, and the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. If you didn't die from disease, didn't die from war, if you didn't die from starvation, I'm going to make you a prisoner into the hand of their foes, into the hand of those who seek their lives, and he will strike them down with the edge of the sword. He will not spare them, nor have pity, nor compassion. You will also say to this people, thus says Yahweh, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who dwells in the city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out of the city and falls away to the Chaldeans who are besieging, you will live, and he will have his own life as booty. I have set my face against the city for harm and not for good, declares Yahweh. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire, scorched earth. And every time you see scorched earth, uh, first of all, there's a famine. And then there's disease because with famine comes disease. Weakened bodies produce disease. Okay. Mark chapter 13, verse 8. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places and there will also be famines. These are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now, what is happening here? Jesus is not talking about what's going to happen prior to the tribulation, although he is in some extent. But he's talking to the Jews and he's saying from a Jewish perspective, after the rapture of the church, you will see these things happening. You're going to see the sword. You're going to see wars. Verse 7, look at that. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do not be frightened for those things must take place, but that is yet not the end. And nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be earthquakes, right? Upheavals of nature. Various places, there'll also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Be on your guard that they will deliver you to the courts. You will be flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations, Right? When is the gospel going to be preached to all the nations? Not before the rapture, but before the great and terrible day of the Lord, that the day of Armageddon, Armageddon. That's when the gospel will be preached to all the nations. A lot of people think the gospel has to be preached to all the nations now before Jesus arrives on the clouds. And to a certain extent, that will be true. But not to the extent it'll happen during the seven-year tribulation. Make no mistake about it, not everyone's going to follow the Antichrist. Not everyone is going to take the mark of the beast. In fact, a very small percentage of people are going to take the mark of the beast. There's going to be so much preaching going on that there'll be no one on any part of any land in Amazon and deep Amazon that will not see an angel fly over and say, don't take the mark of the beast. All right, let's go over to um, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 20. Your strength will be spent uselessly for your land will not yield its produce and the trees of the land will not yield their fruit. Why? Scorched earth. And one of the things that, that kings did back in these days, in the days of Moses, in the days of Pharaoh, even in the days of Jesus, you, you went in, you took out your opponent, you took slaves, you killed everyone else, you burnt down the buildings. And one last thing, you took salt and you had the land salted with salt so it would not be able to grow anything. So a land salted with salt is a curse, not a blessing. 
Verse 21, if you then act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your number so that your roads will lie deserted. This is ready to happen now. And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. And I will bring upon you a sword and will execute vengeance for the covenant which you gather together in your cities. I will send pestilence, sickness, among you so that you shall be delivered into enemy hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. Yet in spite of this, you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me. Then I will act with wrathful hostility against you, and I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. Further, you will eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters you will eat. Wow. Has these things that are coming upon the earth shortly in the first days and months of the tribulation, has they ever happened before? Oh yeah, and they're going to happen again. But we have a word from God. Let's go over to Luke chapter 19. What should we do? Luke 19, verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minus and said to them, do business with this until I come or occupy until I come. What are we to do until this all happens? We're just simply to occupy. That's all we're to do. All we're to do is we're not to walk in fear. We're to go out and occupy. But I'll tell you what, there ought to be fear on anyone here, anyone watching us live or anyone watching us on television about whether or not you're going to be in that tri great tribulation, the seven year tribulation. Amen. And if you operate arrogantly towards God, you can miss the rapture and wind up knowing you're going to have to go through a tribulation. And that will be frightening for sure. Kathy, would you like to join me up here? Well, if you don't know if you got Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's time that you find out and make that knowledgeable in your own mind and in your own heart. Amen. If you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and avoid the Christmas rush to get saved, then do that right now. Just repeat these words out loud with Kathy and I. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come, into my heart right now come into my heart right now and make me a new person, a new, person. A new creation. A new creation. I, don't I don't want to be that old person anymore. Old person anymore. Thank, you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for dying on the cross for me. so that I don't have to die, so have to die. For, all for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, Jesus name, amen and amen and amen. Well, if you just made that decision for Jesus Christ, or you just came back to God for the first time in a long time, I want to hear from you. Email me at pastor at mountainfaith.org or write us at David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 55940. The address is shown on your screen. I'd like to hear from you. We'll send you out this free little booklet, Is the Bible for Real? And in fact, any family that asks for this booklet will send you one per family. Go ahead and write us. We'd be happy to send it out to you. No charge, no obligation. Also, if you're watching us and it's Sunday morning and you're watching on television uh, from some area around the country, you can tune in live and become one of our brand new live viewing partners by tuning us in just a couple hours from now. Go to our website, mountainfaith.org, and click on that. And you can click on all the YouTube links, the Facebook links, or just simply uh, go to our website and watch live from there or watch from uh, Roku. Uh, finally, if you've not yet become a financial partner with this ministry, please consider doing so in this holiday season. We give away a lot of money, particularly this time of year, to those that are hurting both here and all around the globe. Become a regular financial partner. And I guess I have one more thing to say, too. Uh, if you like, help us out in our YouTube channel. Go to our YouTube channel. Find it on our website. Click on the YouTube link. Go there, click subscribe, click uh, the thumbs up and the, then the little bell right on the very end and get notifications from us. Yeah. Praise God.
You know, the Christmas season is upon us. I'd like to see that for those of you that are living nearby where this church is at, that you make this church your strong local church by being here every Sunday during this holiday season. Make it your local church because you are local. Now, if I'm, you're outside the area, you can't be local. But you know who you are. Make this your local church and have yourself be a part of the body of yeah. Christ right. by being here and making this local church a strong local church. That's right. Amen? Amen. And then invite someone with you to come to church too every single Sunday and every Wednesday that you attend and get someone else saved. Don't just make it into heaven yourself. Praise God. Yeah. Well, this is Pastor Dave and Kathy Gonzalez saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here next week yeah. at the mountain.